and amazing boys uh, to the amazing uh, little children that were singing. <laughs> I still don't know the names of everybody, but I'm getting familiar to them. But uh, thank you so much. It was a really beautiful opening. Oh, great. Thank you, Maya. We missed the musical performance on the recording, but we could put a link here later if you like, if you have it on, on YouTube. I'll have to get it. fine to record as well. And thank you for the songs. Uh, thank you, Zoe. This is Parenting and Education meeting number seven. And we, Jackie and I have both been super busy this week. And so we just kind of came up with a, some kind of quick notes that we have, I guess. And we are going to go over some things um, today that Jackie's gonna go over some things that she's going to um, tell more about later. And um, my things aren't really that big of a deal kind of things. I don't know if we'll need to go over later, maybe maybe some another time, but, um, and we have sort of, I put the agenda over in the chat and um, I don't know, how you all feel about the kind of keeping up with the time i kind of like to just be loose with it but <laughs> if somebody wants us to really stick with it we can do that and i guess we um we talked about last time having our um the three minute of our uh the prayer for australia time in the middle and um maybe and i know some people have been talking about they really like to have a three minute stretch break so maybe we can do like a three minute uh prayer in the middle and then the three minute stretch break after that and then at the end however much time we have we can just maybe talk about anything we want to talk about and then after the whole meeting which we agreed before we were going to try and stick to 90 minutes then maybe we can just stop the recording and i'm fine staying on if anybody else wants to just stay on and talk about parenting and education or vegan food or whatever. <laughs> if anybody wants to do that, just more of social talking. But, um, so let's see, well, I guess we'll start. I can set a time for, um, Jackie, do you wanna have uh, like up to 30 minutes? Is that good for your yeah, um, that's fine, and someone keeps track because I can just talk and talk. So I need someone to rein me in. <laughs> so just keep, let me know. Yeah. I'll do this. Okay. Um, so nice. And then that'll be our, um, <laughs> then that'll be like right at our middle time. Okay. Would it be good to give her a five minute warning? You want a five minute warning? That works. Okay. okay. All right. Okay, so really quickly, I'll just give a little bit of the background of how I even got into conscious parenting, why I think it's so important. Um, uh, my children learn differently. And um, when they were um, about eight years old um, is when we lost our eldest child and there was a lot of trauma. We relocated to Arizona a year later um, to get a fresh start. And that's when a lot of the problems with the education system started because it was a drastic difference from being in New Jersey and being in Arizona uh, with children that learned differently. So I had to learn the whole system all over again. That's kind of where um, I started educating myself as a parent how to advocate for my children. Um, because when we were back in New Jersey, everything transitioned from early intervention, which started when they were three years old, and then into preschool disabled, and so the system kind of took care of itself, and I was just kind of there along to, to assist them, where when I was here and they were in fourth grade, it was like I needed to become a full-fledged education act, um, advocate for them. It was kind of in that time where we were struggling, uh, not only from their trauma and the drama uh, of what was going on with the school system, we were all very sick. And so when we transitioned to veganism and I started learning about um, animal agriculture um, and how the animals are treated and the health consequences of that on the planet, and I took Will Tuttle's course and became a facilitator and learned truly the scope and the interconnectedness of the entire system and how it is all about oppression and oppression of being and oppression of consciousness and oppression of the feminine, the wisdom 
that I kind of looked and juxtaposed that with being a mother and said, my gosh, this system has infiltrated our parenting. This is exactly what is going on in our parenting. This is exactly what is going in our school system. It's the same exact really twisted idea of hierarchy and control. And we parents have taken, have basically unconsciously surrendered our hearts to this system that has taught us how to engage and be parents with our children. And we have forgotten really what childhood is. And when I, when I woke up to that reality, it was very painful. It was so painful because not only did I have to look at my children and understand the unconsciousness that I had brought into my, parent, my uh, parenting, but I had to look at the parenting that I had received and the consequences of my parent, the parenting I had received on me, on my siblings, on my relationship with my partner and on my children. And just everything changed because everything that I saw when I was fighting for the animals, when I was fighting for health, when I was fighting for the education, it was the same thing I was fighting for parenting. And it just, it became so abstract and so simple all at the same time. This is, I started searching and I discovered Dr. Shafali Savari. Um, she uh, wrote The Conscious Parent and her most recent book is The Awakened Family. Um, and I started taking her courses and then she opened up an institute to train conscious parenting coaches. And so I enrolled in that and I was trained by her to be a conscious parenting coach. Um, basically, we feel that we are healing humanity one child at a time by, by reintegrating consciousness into the parenting paradigm and awakening people to truly what childhood is, that divinity and that connection, and really what about what is, what is being a child and what is our responsibility as parents. And that is flipping the entire idea of parenting on its head. Uh, parents are justifiably some of the most defensive people on the planet. You question anybody's parenting. So it's, it's a delicate balance to me of the same way when we have to talk about the health consequences of how we eat and about our belief systems and, and how we've inherited our food choices. Our parenting is all inherited as well. And so when we challenge people to the most fundamental lessons we've learned in life is how to be a parent because our parents taught us how to be a parent and how to eat because our parents taught us how to eat, we are challenging the core belief systems of who we are as human beings. And But if we can get and we can shine light on that and get to parents who we know all parents just want to love their children and want the best for their children. And if we can remember that and stop judging parents and helping them wake it, awaken to that, to that unconsciousness that we unwittingly are bringing into the parenting and hurting our children, then we can have an opportunity to welcome these children onto this planet that are trying to give us such a profound message and guidance. So I'll go over really quickly a few notes as to really introduce what conscious parenting is. And um, conscious parenting is basically it's parent focused. It is about raising ourselves. It is not about the child. We believe the child is beautiful, perfect, divine, intact. And it is we parents that are blinded to that connection and do not appreciate our children. Um, it is relationship focused. This is all about connection. This is about, do I see my child? Can I hear my child? Does my child feel worthy? Is my child free to be who they are? So it's a really about the relationship of trust within the parent to offer this safe space for the child. Um, it's need focused. So it is very much about the needs, the sovereign needs of the child and how we have to be so present and out of our own issues and out of our own selves to be present for the needs of the child as the child can communicate and meet the child where they are. And it's all about connection, all about connection. And when we, with any relationship, because I help clients also dealing with their own issues as adults, healing from their parenting issues, but also um, interpersonal relationships. It's all about love and connection first. 
So the Eightfold Principles of Conscious Parenting are non-violent, non-punitive, non-hierarchical, non-shaming or guilting, non-coercive, non-competitive, non-mainstream, and definitely non-linear, because we are spiritual beings and we are not linear, linear beings. So it is all about growth. It is all about growth. It is not about a time, time frame. Um, we believe that the world is bleeding from patriarchal, hierarchical, and linear ways of relating. So it's time for a more compassionate and relational approach to parenting our children where they are seen for who it is they are and not for what they do or for what they can achieve. And that is the core principle of conscious parenting and how to help parents awaken from those belief systems that inform their decisions and behavior towards their children. Um, so I like to start out with like, there's seven core myths that we like to debunk right away. Um, and I'll just go through the first three because they're pretty, and please ask questions because I know this stuff so much, I don't realize sometimes I just talk, talk, talk. Um, so the parenting number one, parenting myth number one, um, is that parenting is about the child. Um, we, how do I say this? We match our expectations on, on our children. So if, if, our, if our expectations for our I, ideal child, who we think when this child comes to us that we think this child is ours, so this is my child, and so my child is going to be a reflection of all the undos that I did in my life, all the mistakes that I have an opportunity to correct, and all the goals that I didn't yet to achieve. My child will get to do these things. So we put a story on our children, and that message is immediately, I don't see you. You are a newer version of me. And that is a message we start sending our children right away, that they are born and they're not enough as who they are. They, are, they will be something once they take on all of our attributes. Then they will become something and they will flourish. So that's one of the first messages we send our kids. And if the children meet our expectations, then they're good. If our children don't meet our expectations, then it's their fault. So right there, the parenting about the hierarchy and about that control and that other is we start from very young. If a child is compliant and they're meeting all our expectations, oh my gosh, I'm such a good parent. Look, look at my child, I'm the trophy child. But when they're not and they're struggling, well then what's wrong with you? There's something wrong with you, what's going on? How do we fix you? And that is one of the first messages when we put everything on the child instead of the parent, instead of meeting the child where they are, instead of seeing that every child is different and unique and the environment that that child is, is growing in perhaps needs some tweaking and some adjustment and is never about the child. Um, we parents are the ones that need to be raised. Uh, we were all, and lovingly and through no judgment, but our parents were unconscious. They raised us unconsciously. That was through no fault. That is the society. They parented the way they were taught to parent, the way society says to parent, with the parameters of, of culture that says what children should become. And that's what they do. So we were raised very unconsciously. So in order to be present for our children, we have the obligation to raise our own consciousness, to wake up out of our own slumber and to heal our own wounds so that we can be present for the child instead of projecting those things onto our children, which is what we do. If a child acts up in some way and we become activated, then the child did something to me. I can't handle when the child has big feelings. I'm uncomfortable, as opposed to a child that's just being a child. And what is within me that is not resolved, that is an injury, that is an old trauma that now this child is shining a mirror on and making me see something that I, is unresolved within me. So it's all about the parent raising themselves and taking responsibility for that, our role. Um, because really the only person that we can control and we truly can influence is ourselves. That is truly our obligation. Um, and we should be present to be able to, to see our children for who they are. And if we do that from the very beginning, we eliminate that need for our children later to seek validation 
to seek approval, to seek that need to belong. If we don't send that message that there's something wrong with them from the beginning, they won't have that need to seek elsewhere, to feel where they belong, where they're not being judged. Um, she gives us some affirmations um, on how to really address this and how as parents, how we can um, really embody this. She says, affirmations to raise oneself. I fully accept that parenting is about raising myself and not my child. I realize that the onus for change lies solely with me and not my child. I am aware that my struggles are reflections of inner conflicts. I will transform each challenge into a question that asks, what does this say about me? That is very difficult to do. <laughs> As, um, it's very courageous to do. And we owe it to our children. We owe it to our nieces and nephews. We owe it to the children next door. We owe it to, we owe it to society for us to raise ourselves to be present for any and all children. They are hurting and they need and they, they want, and children should not be wanting of anything. And to me, that's a clear indication that we adults have to turn around the way we think of the way we see ourselves and the way we see children. Because a lot of the pain that's happening on the planet, that collective, the collective trauma that we all experience is coming from the heart of children that are in pain and suffering. And I'm including the inner children of all we adults that are walking around with our wounds that are still open. It is all those hearts that are bringing all of this, this, this pain and this awareness that we need to do this. So I honor all of us that are here and open to this message. The second parenting myth um, is about being a successful child. Society believes that a successful child is a child that's ahead of the curve. Um, we, we as parents have a very agenda-driven agenda fun role for, for kids. Like everything is an agenda, everything is on the schedule, everything is selected, everything is adult-focused and adult-driven. Um, even team sports are about, you know, who's gonna win and, and you know, what team is gonna get there. And a lot of times you see the adults are the ones that are fighting and the adults are the ones that want those trophies. And those. so it's never about really about children having fun. It's not about playful competition where they can create the rules and they can decide what rules are malleable and they can just decide amongst themselves. No, it's everything is about, well, what's gonna satisfy the adults and what's gonna make the most money for this league? And so we have taken fun out of that, out of the, the childhood and we've put in more about um, potential, focusing on the potential of the child. And one of the most dangerous things we can use is that term potential with our children. Because when we start addressing potential, what we're, the message we're saying is, right now, you're not good enough. But if you activate and you become that, then you'll be somebody in something. So whenever we talk about potential with children, we're saying, you're not quite there yet, but you're almost there. You're on your way. And if you just keep going, it's never telling a child that they're wonderful in the moment and being present with who they are in the moment. It's all about that expectation of what they can be and what they should be. And that's usually driven by, again, the parent's ego to achieve and reach that potential so that the parent has something to boast about. So the parent feels satiated. So the parent feels accomplished. And it's all about satisfying that need within the parent. Um, and it creates so much depression and anxiety in our children because they, they feel that not only in school, but they feel it with their friends. They feel it in social situations where they're never enough. And we're constantly sending the, the message to children that you're never enough. Where potential truly is the light and that spark that, that, awoke, that awoke us when we were in the womb, that potential, that light, that energy is always of what we are and it's always expansive. All we have to do is be in touch with it. 
it's always there. It doesn't go anywhere. We don't have to reach it. It's always present. And that's the message we have to send to our children, that they rely all of that potential within them. And it's to create an environment where that potential has, a, has an opportunity to set root and flourish. Um, so we don't need children to be thinking about imaginary potentials that are within societies or cultures or our parents' heads. We need for them to find how to activate that potential within them and then show us what it is that they need in order to activate that potential is our job then to create that environment for them. She gives us affirmations to create a new curve. I dare to redefine success as measured less by achievement and more by spirit. To allow my child to develop an ownership of life taking their lead on what interests and motivates them. To allow my child to enjoy childhood with as few impositions on their time and space as possible. To expose my child to fun and spontaneous hobbies without turning them into competitive events. To teach my child that the only curve they need to follow is the one that emanates from their own spirit. And to let my child be average. Just be who they are and love and appreciate all the uniqueness of just them being who they are. I've had a lot of pushback on that. And a lot of it, I usually get two responses. If you don't tell them where they're going, where they need to be, then how do they know where they're going? That's a famous one. And if you don't tell a child how to behave or how to be, how to set those morals, especially I, I got pushed back with uh, people that are very religious, that if I don't institute those moralities and those to show them how they can activate the potential by following these rules, then how do children even know how to be moral without those guidelines? And that is the shift that has to occur to see that we all know who we need to be. We all know we are compassionate, loving beings. We are spiritual beings. We are all love. We are all compassion. It is about preventing the forgetting. It's about getting in the way and preventing the brainwashing and preventing the download and preventing the conditioning. Children already know. Children are perfect and wise and compassionate and loving and they show us every single day. And if we get out of our own way and out of our own heads and be present and watch, children will awaken that child within us and we will remember what it is truly like to be human if we watch our children and awaken that within us. And I, that's why I think that is the most important thing to help parents understand is to step back and remember what it was like when you were a child, when you were six and four and you wanted to play. And did anybody ever have to tell you not to hurt anyone? Or would you cry at the idea of something being hurt or injured? That's who we are, and we have forgotten that. And when we reconnect with that within ourselves, then we allow our children, we so appreciate that within them, because it is pure, and it is so close to source energy, it reminds us, and we need to awaken that mirror that our children provide for us. And then the last thing I'll get into, the third myth, um, and this really hurts a lot to talk about because a lot of parents will immediately divide their children into these are the good ones and these are the bad ones. And when you ask basically, well, well, help me explain. Well, why, why is this one your, your good child? That's the good child is because that's the one that doesn't stir the pot. That's the one that's easygoing. That's the one that... Um, allows us to feel like we're in control. They don't push back. And those are the ones that we worry the most about because those are the ones that surrender, that surrender their sovereignty and surrender their identity, mostly for the greater good, mostly to keep the peace, mostly to please our parents. And the ones that are most compliant to me are the ones that I watch out the most. The most that are so quiet are the ones that I look out for the most. Those are the ones that don't know how to ask and are so loving and so feeling that they feel the hurt of the parent and the disappointment of the parent so much that they surrender their own, their own connection to self 
and they surrender that for the love of their parents. And that is very sad and it's very hurtful. And it's, it's one of the things that I look for the most and want to heal the most is when parents divide their children between good and bad. And who are the bad ones? The hyperactive ones, the distracted ones, the loud ones, the defiant ones. They're the ones that are, don't listen. Those are the ones that are called disrespectful. And how do we deal with that? Punishment. We punish them. It becomes punitive because what's happening is that those children are activating in us and making us feel like we're not in control. And the culture right now for parenting is about control. And if a child is questioning my control, just like a teacher, just like government, just like a boss, there's consequences. And it's not about natural consequences with children. It's consequences that don't even make any sense. If you don't do the dishes, you don't play video games. Like, how is that a natural con? What are we teaching our children? Except if you don't do what I say, I'm going to take away your fun. And that's all. There's no lesson to be had. There's no connection. There's no real life lesson. Whereas with my children, for instance, you come home late. Oh, well, you said you were going to come home on time. And... Next time, you're not going to be able to borrow the car because I was up late and I was worried and I need to get to work in the morning and I can't stay up late and worrying. So unfortunately, you're going to have to have one of your friends write, you know, natural consequences where you're dealing with children. It's to say if they break their toy, you sit with them and you have the feelings and stuff. But then we go over, we explain what happened. We understand how we have to take care of our things and the natural consequences of when we're not very careful, they break. They've already experienced a natural consequence. But when we parents get upset, oh, that costs a lot of money. And now, and now there's a consequence over here that makes no sense and we confuse our children. And so we create an environment where either they're being defiant or maybe they're being defensive. Are our children defending their right to be who they are? Are they pushing back because they feel oppressed, because they feel that they don't have a voice, because they feel that the current system is not is not suitable for their growth are they wise and awake enough those are the ones that get the really the worst treatment because i tell you who you are you will be who i say you are and i will determine the life that you're going to have and so we start confusing that defiance with that defensiveness and we need to be present for our children especially for our teens that are going through that liminal space that transition space where they are trying to discover who it is they are and we have to create a space and room for them to experiment and to figure that out. What pearls of wisdom are they taking from childhood into their adult life? And what do they want to leave behind? And not be offended that they don't want to take every lesson we've given them. That's okay. They have a right to be who they are. They have a right to create their own life. And our job is to be here as guides and, and ushers and support and love them through every growth and every experience. Oh my God, that's such good timing. That's the end of myth number three. Let me just read you really quick what she says Well, at the end of it. Excuse me, Jackie. Sorry to interrupt. So <clears throat> my idea is that how about if you have this five minutes and then we have our three minutes and three minutes and then you keep going and I save mine for next time. Well, because I, I knew that it was going to be more than 30 so that I, I said, you know, I bet you if I do the three, it'll be 30. And I'll, I could leave the rest for next time because I didn't take the notes on the rest. There's four more and it's much oh. more expensive. And oh, then I okay. really want to get engagement with everyone. So I want feedback. Okay. Um, so really quickly, um, shifting from goodness to authenticity, instead of obsessing over conformity, perfect behavior, and outward appearances, I will encourage genuineness in my child. Praising compliance, I will praise the courage to be authentic. Demanding obedience, I will encourage self-expression. Defining my child's future based on her performance, I will define it based on the strength of her spirit. And that is how we help parents debunk that myth and understand the new way of thinking and approaching those issues. And I will leave it there. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> and I hope I made some sense. <laughs> I loved it. I think I'm like a bobblehead over here. I'm like, yes, yes, like nodding the whole time. <laughs> and really with like the communities that, that we serve with my nonprofit, where we're underfunded, underrepresented communities, where there's so much racism and oppression, 
We are dealing with children that are going from the school to prison pipeline, foster care. There's so much of that unconsciousness that this is where the parenting is even more, um, even more um, injured because there's a level of unconsciousness is in survival mode. And our children are paying the price for us being so overstressed and so underrepresented and so depressed all the time with no way of looking out or up or seeing a way out. And so we're not even present for our children. We're so reactive. So we really need to heal this if we stand a chance of really creating the vegan world and that still passionate world that we all know is coming. Yeah. Oh, thank you, hard hands. Sophie, thank you. And I just want to say that I, on one hand, I feel really grateful because my kids are 23 and 30 and I really did raise them in, a, in so many ways, how you spoke. So I feel really, really encouraged. And I see that, um, yes, there were shortcomings and yet, wow. I'm so glad I had the knowledge of nonviolent communication from the time my son was in my womb and that I just, this non-authoritarian, you know, having this attitude of non-authoritarian, um, but I needed to respect them. I feel grateful because that was 30 years ago when this wasn't as well known. And I did take a lot of flack a lot so i'm proud of myself that i just said i don't care what people think and the final thing is that um even now as they're finding their way i'm just really they're still finding their way and they're married one of them has had a child that died um at nine months and the other is um they're expecting and so one is going through a grieving process, the other is expecting, so they still need me and we're still healing. My son and I, we do weekly healing sessions where he tells me what he liked about his childhood and what he didn't like. And then I apologize and express my regrets, explain to him why, what was going on. And I think that is maybe, I've never seen that kind of, teaching where you deal with your adult children and 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 maybe I can present that at some time. Beautiful, beautiful. And one of the things that we're working on right now is a um a support group for what where I call it adult orphans of narcissistic parenting. Because a lot of my work also is helping people heal from narcissistic injury. And from personal experience, I was orphaned three years ago by my, by my mom, my, my parents, um, malignant narcissist. And, and that is not a judgment. That is, a, um, that is an acknowledgement of, of, a very, of a very painful, very unconscious, very reactive way of dealing with um, life. And um, there was a lot that I had to heal in my own life. Um, due to due to that level of unconsciousness and, and 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 cruelty, and I had to go no contact in order to to preserve the the emotional and spiritual well being of my children, um, and it causes a lot of hurt. And so we're working right now to help um, individuals who are may still be in um, that relationship where they're with a narcissistic parent. And also um, help them then not bring that unconsciousness into their own. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Wonderful. Oh, what were you going to say? I just wanted to say thank you, Jackie. That was a beautiful presentation. And you put words to so many feelings I've had that I have, I have not been able to put words to. And some of these things I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't even aware of. And um, I just, I'm so appreciative uh, for the chance to be here and, and listen to this and, 
everything everybody is sharing because I definitely feel um, like I was brought up in that, in a pretty op oppressive education system, despite my parents actively trying their hardest. And, you know, I've had conversations with them where they've asked, hey, what, what could we have done better? What, what did you like? What didn't you like? And, you know, I would have, I was at a total loss to even, to even talk to them about it because I, we aren't, well, I wasn't educated on, on education itself. And this conversation here has already inspired me to say so many things. Um, I, I want to have a conversation with them. Um, and, and I know it's affected Suzanne because I can just tell by her reactions to things that you were saying too, that um, some of the things we were saying were really important to us. And, and I think will be helpful in kind of conveying some of the feelings we've had um, in trying to communicate with, with our parents. And so I'm just like super grateful and I don't want to take up too much more time before the break, but, um, thank you. Thank you. It's just occurred to me that, uh, um, we've talked about homeschooling and unschooling. Um, and my parents were teachers they in the uh, public school system and I was in the public school system not only was I not homeschooled I had the opportunity to be in their class and they said specifically that they didn't want me in their class they didn't want my brother and myself they made this this conscious decision to not be responsible for our education <laughs> let's see even worse <laughs> The one opportunity. Well, I did have my, my dad as a, a gym teacher for most of my primary school and intermediate school, but it's just like one day, one day a week, I think, or one course per week. I, oh yeah, I, I think I've got a lot to, I, I got to rope them into this conversation somehow. We'll have, uh, bring your, your, uh, public school, uh, teacher to meeting one day <laughs> gotta hurry though because they're they're starting to die off according to Facebook that is a conversation later that we're bringing that we're also working on is is to marry this with the teaching so it's conscious teaching and then bring this this way of thinking into the school systems that already exist Does anyone else want to share anything before we have our three minute um, prayers for us, prayers for Australia, for the fires to go out? Um, I just want to say thank you, Jackie. It was amazing. And yes, I do believe that many of us, we are definitely identified by the way we were raised. And um, I, um, I mean, we have, me and you have conversations every morning and a lot of the times we we touch this uh, very delicate spot talking about our childhood and just the way we are in a way trying to become the best version of ourselves to raise our kids um, and I just wanted to say thank you thank you it was amazing <laughs> thank you I think there's been such a change in education and, and a, this recognition of what's wrong with uh, our system that's designed to prepare us for the world rather than prepare a child to be a child and later on be an adult. Th that shift in focus is so so small to say, yet so profound in, in, in the approach that education has taken. And I guess it was a function of the... Um, industrial revolution and maybe it had a purpose at it in its time but it doesn't anymore uh is there any point in in uh going back a generation or two to analyze 
what they did right and what they did wrong, or is it just uh, you know it's it was what it was, it's obsolete, and 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 uh, we have this opportunity to look forward to the future where I can't wait to see a generation of kids taught that way. We don't know what the potential of the human race is, but that's got to be you know the cornerstone of of that happening. Um, if I may, really quickly, because I know we want to take a break, and this may not be very popular, the entire, the entire educational system needs to go. It's, 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 it started out with the function of producing administrators for the empire. That was the job of education, is to create producers for the system. That is, education is not, there's no learning in, in our educational system right now. This is all about producing, pro producing more producers. It's a factory system. And those that conform to the system, they achieve. But you have to sacrifice all of your individuality and all of your essence in order to become what the label of success is in the system. The entire education system has to go away because natural learning is not even happening. Creativity is not even happening. If anything, it's frowned upon. Individuality, a child's essence, our, our natural ability to be scientific and be explorers, that's what children are. We are scientific, we are explorers, we are creators, we are inventors, we are fantasy. We are the true manifestors. As children, we are the ones that take all of the infinite universe and bring it into real life. And parents that don't understand, that's pretend. For a child, that's not pretend, that is real. That is real, and we stifle that in our school systems so that they can be who we need them to be, so that they can go and make us money. So the entire system has to go right at the knees, all of it. That's very compatible with everything that we're uh, trying to install into all the, the uh, study groups in base, in base camp, that uh, systems don't get tweaked to perfection. There's no such thing there. Not machines that can be fixed. The parts aren't replaceable. They're living things that have a, a peak, a decline, and a, and a depth that has to, we have to replace it with something and replace it with something better. So great opportunity. And I'm sorry, I'll, and I have to push back a little bit as a woman of color and a woman that has been raised in that oppressive, the system is not broken. It is perfect. It is working exactly as it was designed to work. The system is working beautifully, and we see every day the effects of the system working beautifully. If you ask those people on top, the economy is great. Jobs are great. Entrepreneurship, creativity, none of that. But you know what? The ones on top are making money. The system works perfectly. The education system is working perfectly. The system needs to go because it is not designed for us. It is designed for them. Well, we put it to have the, um, the three minute prayer time first, but um, because I didn't bring the noisemaker here, is everyone okay with switching? And we'll have the three minute stretch break first and I'll go get it as I stretch. <laughs> okay, great. So I'll start our three minute stretch break and I will come back with the rain sound. Do we want to pause recording now maybe? Oh yes, thank you. Um, oh, we're going to do the gallery view recording for it? Is that what we're doing? I switched it over to gallery view. I don't think the first section. Well, actually, I'm not sure if this is either because this is part of the same recording. It's a settings that you have to go onto the web. Okay. Well, I'll just stop my uh, video as we do it so people won't see me with my eyes closed if it goes that way since the sound will be coming from me. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll pause it. For the for the recording thank you okay so um, I'm just going to talk briefly about part of one thing um, from this book called nurture shock and Jackie and I both have this book and um, I had to reorder it recently actually because I'm not sure where mine went but but I got it I don't know years and some amount of years ago and um, and one thing it talks about in the book is talking about race. And I think the specific title is um, 
why white parents don't talk about race. Does teaching children about race and skin color make them better off or worse? And uh, talking about it is better. And so now I didn't reread the book and I read the book many years ago. So I looked at the title of the chapters and I'm like, oh yes, I remember that. And so for me, some things that I do personally with parenting, I figured out kind of intuitively what I think is right and best based on either um, the parenting that I received, did I think this was a good thing to keep, you know, let's, yeah, that seems good, let's do that. Or, well, that I don't think was good, so I'm gonna not do that. And, um, and I, as far as talking about race, I don't, I don't know. So my dad, um, like I talked about before, taught, um, ESL, English to and English English as a second language, which well I'll just say he also said they were contemplating calling it E N L English as a new language because many children and people who come here from other countries already speak two or more languages and so to call it English as a second language is not even really not always accurate. But um so he was always around um and therefore I was sometimes around people from all over the world and we always, since I was little, we always ate at, um, we rarely ate at restaurants that were not um, having people from other countries owning and working in the restaurant. So we ate at a lot of Vietnamese restaurants, and that was the, the, the main one we did, and my dad spoke Vietnamese and he would speak to people, mainly in English though, but, um, and we ate at Chinese restaurants and sometimes Thai restaurants and sometimes Italian restaurants, and I think those were mainly Americans working there. I'm not sure who owned them, but um, so I was around a lot of those people. And I don't know um, a, a lot of people from other countries, and I don't know if um, I don't actually recall if I was ever directly spoken to about people of about any different races or uh, people from other countries. I don't really remember that, but I know that I definitely learned incidentally that. People are come from different places and people have different colors of skin and people are different in many different ways. And that is all okay, fine and good. And we treat everyone the same, no matter what, you know, or if we, if it's not the same, it's in a way that makes sense. So if there's someone say who um, has a disability or needs help with something, well, we're not gonna say, well, we'll treat you the same. So <laughs> you don't get any help, not like that. Um, but so anyway, in the book, it talks about, I think, um, when parents think we're just going to be colorblind, nobody, nobody talk about this, would everybody just, um, you know, we won't say anything because then we're drawing attention to it. And I found when my daughter was very, very young, well, she noticed when people looked different than us in different ways or when, um, with animals. So I wanted to put this in here, speciesism also. And whenever there are any beings that are different than the beings of the family, children notice that. And so if you don't talk about it at all, well, then any number of things can happen. So then who else are they around? What are they hearing? So if, if the parents don't say anything and at, let's say if the children are at school and there's racism that that they're around at school then they've got to figure that out on their own and if so anyway the book is talking about do talk about it and don't just let it be and be like i'm not going to talk about this because then it's going to bring it up and no but if we don't talk about it then it'll just be like everyone is you know i don't know i don't know just don't talk about it it's, it's saying don't to do talk about it and um and yeah this this is totally separate but i just thought of this um i mean it's not totally separate but when i was in preschool i went to preschool at a um a community college and on the playground there was a, a little girl i remember who i guess she wasn't in my class and i never saw her except on the playground and she was deaf and I remember um, one day or a couple of days, I saw her going around the playground hitting other children, like kind of punching them in the arm or something. 
And and I noticed that I I remember now this was you know when I was in preschool, but my memory of it is that she wasn't playing with other children there. And I didn't know her because I only just saw her when we were outside on the playground at the same time. And I remember somehow I knew that she was deaf. And I remember my mom had said that she taught sign language or else maybe this is when I found out. And I told her, I remember I told my mom at home, there's this little girl on the playground and she's deaf and she goes around and she's hitting the kids on the playground. And I knew that I just felt like, what can I do to, um, can I do anything to help her? You know, and I didn't know what to do because I couldn't talk to her and have her hear me. And so my mom said, okay, what you can do is go up to her and look at her and make sure she's looking at you and then um, tell her no, like this. This is no in sign language. And, and then see, see what she does. And my memory is that it happened again and I went up to her and looked at her and, and did this and smiled at her and she just kind of froze there. And then I, I seem to recall that then we played. <laughs> and I don't know how, how we played or what we played, but my memory is that, um, that I did that and then she kind of froze and looked shocked and then we, and then we went on. And then I don't remember anything else. And that's, all, I think I only have one other memory of preschool. And that was tracing some fish. But um, anyway, I just, talking about any differences, I think, are important. So that was a difference of how to communicate. And so no one there was, I don't believe my memory is that no one at the preschool was helping all of the children to know how to communicate with this one girl um, who communicated differently than we did. And, um, and so I think to me, it's all, that's, this is all related. And so if, if we don't talk about the differences and what we can do about the differences, then well, any number of things can happen, but it's better to talk about, to talk about it all. And, that's really um, I'd like to, to say something on that, um, especially the, the, the racism part, because it's so important. Um, talk about collective unconscious and, and, and collective trauma and ancestral PTSD. Hello. <laughs> um, the two things that I'd like to, to, to bring up um, was another workshop we're working on is um, a social, part of the social justice series. And um, it's called White Fragility. And there's um, uh, this, this uh, lecturer and teacher uh, called Robin D'Angelo that wrote the book White Fragility. And she's an Italian woman and she's speaking to her white brothers and sisters about this topic, about white fragility, about not talking about race. And the two things that come up especially, which I think it's so important because it, if we plan to heal anything, we have to understand each other. And we, as people of color, need to understand why that system stays in place and the thinking processes that maintain it in place. So as we can stop judging individuals and understanding that there is a belief system that is deeply ingrained and rooted into their identities, that is fueling their behavior and their choices. And to stop, uh, stop blaming people and see people as, as perpetuating a, a, an unconsciousness. And that's where the healing begins with understanding. So the two things that come up is um, when, when we teach, especially our children, that you know not to see race we don't talk about race two things happen the one thing is you we are severely denying an entire population of people their reality and we don't have the ability to not see race we don't have the ability to pretend that race doesn't exist we don't have the ability to be willfully blind and not talk about certain things because we are the things that you're not talking about. So in you not acknowledging, and I'm not saying you, I'm saying the individual, not, not acknowledging race is denying me my reality because my reality will never be your reality as a white person. Never. 
And for you not to talk about it is completely dismissive of my reality and my experience. And the second thing is it maintains the system in place. And being, being anti-racist is not the same as not being a racist. Not being a racist is I don't participate in that personally, but it's all about me. When we are anti-racist, we call the system out. We call it by its name. That demon will have a name. It will come into the light and we will address it and we will talk about what fuels it and maintains it and feeds it. That is the difference. And when we, we act willfully blind and we say, you know, not us, what we are saying is it's okay as long as it doesn't affect me and I don't contribute, but it's there. So if we're not participating in something, that means there's something that we are choosing not to participate in. And we're not doing anything about that. We're just choosing not to be a part of it. So I think it's very important that we continue to shine the light and continue to, to bring up these, these conversations. Um, it's, it's much deeper than, than even about race. It is about a denial of how the system in place sees white people as not having ethnicity and color. And everyone there's, and then there's everyone else, everyone that has color, and then those that don't have any. And so we're trying to fight and um, deny our own selves in order to make to become something that we will never be. And that is the system that's in place. So we, it's very important that we show our children this. We help them understand this, so they not only will not participate, but they will never allow it in their presence. They will, never, they will never allow it amongst their friends. They will never see themselves as participating in a system of inequality. So I think that's why it's so important. Yes, and because, they, because first, right, like, like we're talking about the, that everyone can see, and it's not like, <laughs> You just can't pretend like that nobody's going to see any differences. I mean, just even physical, you know, differences. And and also to not talk about it is, it. I mean, I don't know exactly how, you know, these, anything having to do with any of all this uh, is covered in the school, but um, what the children know what parents can contribute to what the children will know it, by talking about it and everything that is included and when it is relevant can just bring so much that this is very vague what i'm saying so <laughs> but just to that it's important to talk about it and especially and as different things come up over time too because different things will come up at different times and to just not talk about it it's just yeah you say it much better than i do jackie but the system is in place and it is held in place by those that refuse to acknowledge its existence by those that refuse they maintain the system in place and we have to take position and we will never achieve our 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 goal of truly breaking out of the system and creating a compassionate world of radical inclusion and radical compassion and understanding and love and truth if we don't unmask all of those demons that are still possessing us and keeping us in this system. And they have a shackle. They have a shackle through our belief systems. And if we do not shine a light on that, we will never be able to free ourselves from this. And we have a moral obligation that if we see that world that we know is coming, that we know that we are ushering in, that our heart light and our soul songs are ushering in like an opus, we have to acknowledge those things that are still weighing us down and bringing us in. We have a moral obligation to shine truth and light and say no more, whether it be to our individual families, whether it be to the animals, whether it be to our neighbors. Wrong is wrong. And if we don't stand up and we start saying wrong is wrong, then nothing will change. And that's just not an option. It's just not. It's reminding me of the quote, um, the world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch them without doing anything. Thank you both for your thoughts on that.
Um, um, Patricia sent a message uh, reminding us of the time. So um, we, we also have to get going soon too. It feels like maybe race can be on our list to keep talking about. Jessica, I know you mentioned that we could talk about this for a long time. So it, it, this does feel like a, like a foundational part to, to bring into parenting and education. Um, so I'm hoping we can keep that discussion going. That reminds me of something that, that I was thinking as I was going through the different groups, because that was absolutely a topic that we'll cover in the Vegans Dismantling Systemic Oppression group. Uh, education is so central to all the groups. Uh, whenever there's something to learn, we have to, you know, we have to study groups to study it, but we also have to somehow get it out to people. So we, we have medical education uh, task force. We have uh, um, speciesism education task force. This group obviously is focusing on, on uh, childhood education, but there really isn't a, I mean, you were talking about uh, teaching racism and it was just like exactly the same as teaching speciesism. Uh, 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 carnism is this unspoken, you know, agreement that we don't need to pay attention to whether we eat meat or not. We all do it. It's, it's like a, some sort of a consensus. So therefore we don't need to justify anything. We don't need to pay any attention to carn to uh to speciesism um but the techniques that we're talking about here in in uh in educating children our society is is a child that's trying to find its way so there's lots of uh lots of parallels constantly so it's it's uh yeah there's so much there that uh, we could could unpack i was going to talk about my childhood it was in northern manitoba so a, picture a thousand kilometers north of Winnipeg we had uh, maybe one or two black families in the in the town while I lived there for almost 20 years uh, maybe two Asian families uh, one or two uh, Indian families so racism was largely a tension between the white population and First Nations because there was a, a, a lot of uh, uh, Cree that lived in the town and to make it more complicated Métis so there's you know people that were half half uh, Cree I'm sorry Ray can I just interrupt for a second I just want to make sure that I'm respecting those that said that they wanted to go ahead we can continue yeah. talking but those that needed to, to go I just wanted to, to, to respect that and say goodnight if they would yeah need to go. I really need to go so thank you everybody Thanks, yeah, Patricia, for that was my long-winded way of saying that there's lots more to talk about. So good thing that she stopped me from talking about it. <laughs> no, I wanted I wanted to hear the rest of what you said. I just wanted to make sure that they they needed to go that we honor them. Bye, guys. Uh, bye, bye. Bye, bye, everyone. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>、Oh, s o r r y Ray. What were you saying? You said that you had two families with, that were part of the First Nations. I'm sorry. The town that I grew up in was、uh, very much、uh, either you were either white or First Nations or Métis, which is a, a blending of the two, sometimes for many generations.、Um, so encountering you know, other races from, other, from people from other countries was so rare. I remember one of the curriculum for the school was to read Two Solitudes, a book about the tension between the English speaking and French speaking Canada. And we had no idea. Everybody in the class was like, wow, did you know that the, like, there's all this tension in, in、uh, Quebec about,、uh, between the whites and the, and the French speaking people? We had no idea. <laughs> so we're like real, discovering it. And it was good in a way because. We were able to say immediately, well, this is, this is stupid. I can see it's stupid from the beginning. Why, are, why do I have all this tension? We should get along. It's obvious. So, you know, kind of living in a bubble was a, a bit strange,、uh, being exposed to issues of, of racism. But、uh, 
the uh, the racism between whites and and First Nations people is really hard to unpack. It was really hard to see uh, quite uh, just too close to the to the topic to really get a sense of it. I've done so much research on this for for my work with the ancestral PTSD and collective trauma, and um, so much of the history is in the uh, the schools. Those um, and I'm and I'm I'm losing the name of it. The uh, where they took the children, the indigenous children. Um, so much of that is still experienced today. The trauma and the drama of of how they treated these children and how they were raped and abused and molested and I mean it, and missing. Uh, I mean I've watched documentary after documentary. I have books and books on these stories. These these the you know, the, the adoptions, the mass adoptions that they used to have, um, stripping away their identity. That, I mean, erasing their history altogether. And this happens in all the indigenous populations on all the Western Hemisphere with, as, as they conquered. It's, it's, this happened in, in Ireland. This happened in England. This has been, there's been assault on childhood. And this is the domineering culture erasing and eradicating through the children, that culture. And, and so much of it is still felt today, um, so much of it. I mean, we, I still talk to people that are in the indigenous populations here that talk about their grandmothers that were survivors of this. And that's, so that's still fresh in, in a narrative in these families. I mean, a generation or two ago, that trauma is, is deep and is longstanding. And the fact that we don't know that I have to do my own personal research to find this out is a travesty. And that is a demon in itself. That is, that is the hidden trauma without that, that acknowledgement to say that we, we stole the children. We, we devastated the children that, that these are, that have no identity, no family, no roots. You want to dismantle a civilization? you go after the children and that's what they did systemically systematically and, and, and we had no idea we, it wasn't anything that we knew anything yeah. about i've heard of resident schools residential schools just like in the last five years or so i it's not something i was at any awareness i'm not sure how much of it was happening in my area but it could, definitely could have been happening there was a lot of reservation areas around the the town the town itself was yeah. you know kind of a a, a mixture of of uh people because it was a mining town and there was a lot of uh, population from Newfoundland that moved from mines there and set up in this town. And there's so much injury also because these residential schools were run by the church. Mm -hmm. So there was so much trauma there from just the church and how it was treated and that brainwashing. It's, 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 there's so much there that all it needs is acknowledgement. All it needs is awareness and acknowledgement in order to liberate this, this trauma, so in order to heal generations and move forward. It's just to acknowledge, to own it. Because if we acknowledge it or we own it and we validate your experience, we validate your reality, then we can assure that we will not take this into the future. But if we keep denying it and we keep acting like it didn't exist, then we are just inviting that, that, that unconscious process and those patterns of behavior back into our lives over and over again. And that is the pain, that we just keep reliving this pain over and over in ourselves, in our, in our, in our hearts, and in our culture. I'm so glad you brought this up, Jessica. I really, really am. Really am. And you know what, Jackie? Uh, or everybody here it um and it happens that well we have a saying that we say that basically true true spiritual uh initiation starts within ourselves and then as it starts within ourselves it it starts with working within your own um house your your family um it's sad that even in, for example, in, like I'm originally from Mexico, it is very devastating and sad to see that even my own culture, uh, there is racism within our own brothers and sisters, just because 
some are whiter than other ones. I don't know what is it about always, we have a tendency of always feeling a little more, and I mean, not that I am like that, but I am gonna generalize. Um, so we feel like we're a little more than the person that are darker skin. And I mean, it happened in my family. With my family, uh, with my, my grandmother, she, her father was uh, from, from Spain, and he was tall and white and blue eyes. And, um, and she, it, it's a long story, but something happened to her where she was not okay with having indigenous people around her. And I cannot blame her because her childhood itself was devastating for her. So um, I believe that this is something that we have to procreate within our, our environment, um, our own families, teach our kids that no matter what color they are, no matter how tall they are, no matter what color of eye they have, we're all the same inside. We all carry the same spirit. Our soul is, is different. Our, basically, our body is just the vehicle for us, our soul and our spirit, but we are all the same. It's like, I always tell my kids, we are one. It doesn't matter. You break a, a white egg, you break an orange, um, not an orange, but a, a darker egg or a, a more darker air, and, and what's inside is the same thing. It doesn't make no difference. So yeah, racism is definitely something that we have been very traumatized for generations and generations, and we still carry it. We still carry it, and a lot of people, they're still stuck with that, where all they see a newborn, and even my aunts, when they go to the hospital, if someone's gonna have a baby, and they're like, oh, he's a little darker, but they use it in Spanish aspects. He's a little darker, you know, and it's, it's just sad. It's just sad. Sometimes you just wanna, make people understand it in different ways. Uh, and in the other aspect, we also have to realize that not all the people have the capacity. A lot of people, they are high in ego. And no matter how many times you tell them the reality, they won't understand. So it's a matter of trying to bring that information to our families, our society, but also accept that there's the other part of humanity that I don't know what's gonna happen in order for them to understand we, we have to accept that that's the way they are and they're not gonna change. I agree, I agree. And, and as, as you know, with the same history, you know, when as, as, as a people you're oppressed, it becomes a survival. I, I resemble more of the oppressor than of the oppressed. So that gives me a leg up. That gives me better opportunity and more advantage. Because if, 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 if the whole system is against us, then we turn to each other with all that frustration and all that pain, and then we lash out of each other. So we have to find differences within each other so that at least I won't suffer as much as you. I need to be less suffering than you. And it's all about what's less suffering. What's less suffering is I can relate more and I resemble more the oppressor than the oppressed. So at least I won't suffer as much as you. At least I have a better chance of assimilating into the system than you do. So it's all about just perpetuating pain and pain and violence on violence. And it's all it is. And it takes us out of that. And so we see differences where they don't exist because we've adopted that that mindset of difference and difference and difference. And when you're in survival, well, at least I'm not that. At least I'm this, but I'm not that. And we do it to each other. And that's how the system then, they can step back and let us all be crabs in a, in a barrel by ourselves. Then they don't need to do the shackles. We do it to ourselves. And we destroy ourselves within. And they know this. They know what they're doing. This is psychological warfare. And when they stop through the ability to keep us in chains, then they change our minds and they change our spirits. And that's how they keep us in place. So we need to be talking about this and bringing awareness of this because this is, a, this is spiritual warfare. And they, they could not do it anymore, physical form, but they have hijacked our brains and they have hijacked our hearts. And that is not something that is gonna be sustainable. And this is the system that we're seeing. And Jackie, like you said uh, a few minutes ago, if if someone wants to, I can't remember how you said it, but 
destroy a what did you how did you say it destroy a community or a um then they go after the children how did you say it if the, if their goal is is to decimate a culture yes okay where you you infiltrate childhood mm -hmm. and so now the reverse is also true if you want to bring forth all of the good all of you the revive good, childhood equality yes. you go to the children and you it's help all about the children it really is it's it's the it's the beginning and the end they're everything they're everything and it's we that are awake that see we that have had the opportunity to recognize our inner child to love our inner child to welcome our inner child home to raise ourselves and love that part of us and integrate that part of us so then we can now honor true childhood and honor true childhood like the way we would have liked to be honored when we were children how we would have liked to have been seen and respected and mm -hmm. and appreciated as children now it is our moral obligation to then offer that to our children because they do have the answers just just like you said that's the way to destroy but that is the way to revive So I think on that note, now I think I'm ready, ready to feed the dogs and go to bed. Sounds good. So um, is there anything left on the agenda besides what we decided, like for closing or anything? Or um, fine? Oh, I just, um, if we wanted, we could go around kind of how we did in the beginning and share anything it doesn't have to be about tonight it can be about anything anybody wants it to be about that's what i was thinking uh i would just like to say that i just love everyone in base camp and vegan world 2026 and these groups and the opportunity to meet such amazing people ray i've learned so much from you and sharing i just love learning other cultures and countries and societies. I've learned so much. Thank you so much for sharing. It is such valuable information for me. I do. I leave the meetings and I think about, man, what it must have been like, you know? Um, uh, I had Will Tuttle here for an event last week and it was just an amazing way to start out like 2020 and his does not stop, even though I had a little hiccup of getting sick. But it is just so amazing what's going on and all that we're doing and all that we're accomplishing. And you can feel the manifestation unfold right in front of us. And it's just so beautiful. So I, just 2020 is going to be, it's, it, that's the tipping point. <laughs> it is. For a lot of people, I see many people, people complaining about 2020, the coronavirus, uh, all of the politics and all that stuff. But in reality, I feel like uh, so much opportunities for us to self-grow. Uh, definitely. There's no doubt of that. And thank you so much, Jackie, for what you shared. Uh, it was amazing. And to Ray, Ray, I always get so amazed at his backgrounds. I, I just love it. <laughs> I feel like I'm the normal guy. I've, I've got the public school education in a, you know, a very white community. Um, only living in a in a city, and now I live in one of the most multicultural cities in the world. Uh, but I've learned so much about uh, you know all the things that I've taken for granted, all the things about education in particular that I go, it is what it is. Um, accept it, learn how to adapt to it, and uh, of course, I've only been an activist for four years, so that idea that we can take. Um, mm -hmm control of the situation and start to shape our society is pretty new to me. So thanks for all that 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 I've I've been learning from this course. I just want to say thank you so much everyone. I just love it and parenting and education is my whole world and I just love it and I could talk about it all day all night. <laughs> and and I love how you talk about everything, Jackie. It, and I'm like, oh, well, I can't say it. I, that, yes, yes, uh -huh, yes, yes, yes. Um, so I love how you say everything. And Ray, yes, I love everything you're sharing and you're saying. It seems so normal, but it's not, you know, you're in a totally different place, you know, with the, it is different. I see what you mean, but, but I love hearing it. And Myra, um, and I'm, oh, Myra, how you were talking about um, telling your children how we are all one. And I say the same 
thing to my kids and we were all one and, and all of that. And that it starts with a family and, and, oh, and this is like, Ray, what we were talking about in the, um, the veganizing, no, normalizing vegan food task force one time, um, about the, you were talking about, um, think globally, act locally, how locally your kitchen. I think that's relevant here. Think globally, act locally, how locally your home and with, with our own family. Act locally, as local as your school, and get your kids out of there <laughs> as fast as possible. Uh, I'm going to submit a list of um, the books that were part of my curriculum that I think are so incredibly valuable, so we can add them on, especially it'll include her books as well, three of them. But um, I, And I cannot wait to discuss the list with you, Jessica. You know, we could just talk about this all this. But yeah, and I think it's really valuable to help. So I'll be I'll be sending that soon. Right. I, I, think, I think that Ray put um I put somewhere some list of books and I think Ray put them maybe in docs and files. So I think okay. there may be a sheet already. Maybe All right, uh, perfect. I can't remember where it is because that was a little while back. But I think All we right. already have one list going. All right, perfect. Okay. All right. I just want to say good night to everyone. Thank you. I love you all. You guys are the best. Uh, make my heart just like. <laughs> good night, everybody. Good night, right, good night. Until next time. <laughs> good night. Bye, all right. bye, guys. Good night. Good night. Oh, my <laughs> that's a cute one. Bye, bye. Bye.